Well, good morning, Southside. Special welcome to any visitors. We're grateful to have you come and worship with us. I have a special visitor where his parents helped us start this church 25 years ago in October. And so Luke Gifford and his family have come in town to be with us. So those who were in the original startup, come see Luke and his family. And it's sweet to see them all grown up with three kids and a godly wife. And they're just a a huge blessing. I've loved that young man since he, I think you were about six or seven when we got started. And so welcome, welcome. Next week, we're going to be partaking of the Lord's table together. Is it my hearing or is this thing on? It's on? Okay. It's allergy season started, so just, just pretend like you can hear me. I don't know what's going on. Um, so the communion table next Sunday, it's going to be Palm Sunday, and we're going to have a special focus on the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll enter into Holy Week to consider all that he did to ransom us, to redeem us from our sin and bondage. And I just want to encourage you to slow down from the rat race and really spend some time just focusing on what Jesus Christ has done for us. Devotionals abound. There are so many. If you need help finding a good one, I would love to help you with that. If you can get off early on Good Friday around three o'clock to spend some time just meditating on the one who said it's finished and bowed his head and accomplished our salvation. So try not to fill up the week with busyness, but to do business with your maker uh, during this season. So may God redeem it for our good and his glory. Uh, I'm excited for this time. Well, we finished up CTM last week, and some of you started making some good strides in your evangelism, and I just wanted to keep encouraging you how to make those baby steps and going forward. Uh, Andrea Uh, She is running a prison ministry to to write letters to those who are incarcerated. So just a a great way to, to, you know, maybe it's less intimidating to be writing letters than going door to door or something. Uh, I encourage you, is Andrea here? If you are, wave your hand up. If you aren't, sorry for calling you out. There she is. (laughs) Wave it one more time. So she, she would love to help you get connected with a, a prisoner to begin interacting with the gospel, and um, I encourage you with that. The nursing home, they're always in need of people who would come and want to share the gospel. Uh, they, they have a service, they're preaching, and just to, to be sharing with those saints, um, lots of opportunity. Let's keep taking those steps forward to tell everyone we can about the good news of Jesus Christ. And last week, Zab shared about his call to Ubekistan. Um, um, He's going to have letters, right? Letters of support to let you know more details. Uh, I like that he's a rookie. He just wants to follow Jesus, and he didn't have letters last week. He didn't have anything. But this week, he's prepared. He's got it. Did we get it set up for the codes? Do you know if that got worked out? Okay, we'll, we'll, I'll keep working on that. But uh, Zab, if you could, if he come up here afterwards up front again with those, and l- let's do everything we can to help him go share the gospel there for two years. That is such a beautiful calling. So this morning, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to continue uh, looking at this chapter. And I, I heard an encouraging thing from, from many of you, but this... This one gal who grew up in legalism and was a perfectionist. Those two have never married well. Uh, Legalism and a perfectionist. And really living into the, the full acceptance that you have in Christ, that you really live under no condemnation, uh, is a journey. And she's been going through the whole book of Romans for 26 years at Southside. And she said it was Romans 12 that finally is bringing freedom because I'm, I'm looking now at obedience and where it flows out of my justification that I'm accepted and, and I'm living into loving God and loving others. And it, it, the freedom just connected in there. And I've heard that from several of you. And I just pray that we keep learning how Romans 12 comes out of relationship with Jesus Christ, not a new law. And so we're going to continue trying to understand that and journey together. So let me read this section that we're going to finish up. 
this morning, and we will pray. Turn to Romans 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's ask God to bless his word to our hearts. Father, we continue to worship you now in the the proclaimed word of God. And I pray that we would sit and worship that this gospel transforms hearts and lives. And God, it changes us and it allows us now to be free to love you and to love other people. And what we look at this morning, enemy love, happens in no other place, no other area, no religion. God, Christianity alone calls us to this enemy love. And I pray that you will work deeply in each and every one of our hearts to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. I'm asking for freedom, God, that you would set all of us free who have the vestiges within this remaining sin in our own lives of wanting to punish and choke or have bitterness or anger towards those in our journey who have hurt us. God, would this be the day of complete release as we stare into the gospel of Jesus Christ? Lord, meet us, set us free from the slavery of holding these people in prison who have wronged us. God, use the word this morning to do mighty things in each and every heart. By your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So two weeks ago, we began looking at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And it, it hit a, a chord in the body that I didn't anticipate. Like it, it went deep and it, it brought out a lot of response. And, and for, for that, I'm grateful that God's working in our hearts. Um, and I just spent some time thinking and praying, why did that hit such a chord? And I was kind of listening to some things and it clicked for me this week. Just maybe the big picture is why, why do people come to America? Why do they move here? And it's, it's what this country promises. It's, it's really what most of us have grown up in thinking. The pursuit of life, liberty, and justice for all. And this liberty is to a protected life. It's protected by laws and law enforcement. It's, it's just the, the alienated rights that we have. I have the right to this life. That's what I've been raised and taught. And then if someone crosses my right for this, it brings anger, frustration, rage. It just stirs it up all the more. And the cry of our hearts is justice, which is part of an image bearer of God. But we're looking at vengeance. I have rights and you can't treat me this way. It's just so deep within us. It's ingrained in every one of us. So that when we come to a verse like this, it messes with us. If I just let them get away with what they've done, that's not fair. Something needs to happen. They destroyed my life, pastor. And you're saying, give them a meal, (laughs) pray for them, bless them, ask God to bless them. What is wrong with you? That's cute, but that's not real life. It violates everything within me, the sense of justice. I have the spiritual gift of justice, and you're telling me not to exercise it? You go read every list. It's not in there, and it's not in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, justice, peace. It's not there. The strong sense of justice needs answers to help with the statement we looked at in verse 14, and it did. It stirred up a lot, and it was just kind of this principle that you had 100 questions that weren't answered. 
And I hope this morning we can begin to answer some of those questions. <laughs> One teacher I listened to had a good point. He said, the rights that we demand were just, they were not there in first century Christianity. And that day when this was written, all the nations were run by dictators, just dictators every turn. And, and when Paul's writing this, it's Caesar, Caesar. The, the first hundred years of Christianity, the, the faith, Christianity had zero protection. If you said, uh, Jesus Kurios, Jesus is Lord, you could die for that. That's who's being written to. You, you own allegiance to Jesus Christ and your, your leaders want to kill you. Your government is against you. And they never cried out, we have rights. Because they had none. We have the right to die for Jesus Christ. Peter said, beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you because of Nero, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. This is what happened in that day. What is strange is the hundreds of years of rights that we've had in America. It, it's an anomaly in, in his, the history of the church. So with this, we grew up in it, there comes a very deep sense of justice. And I can't let someone do this to me. Justice needs to be served. They can't get away with it. It needs to be made right. If I don't do anything, it's acting like what they did was okay. And so we need to hear what the Spirit of God says to our hearts this morning on this subject because times are changing and we need to get this really bad as a people of God. And so may God meet us and show us his will this morning. Two weeks ago, let me pray. Father, we need this. Lord, it runs deep in our flesh to retaliate and to get revenge and to want those who hurt us to be hurt. Only you could set us free. And it is only in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we could ever be set free. Watching the one in our place bear the full wrath of God for what we deserved. Lord, do more than we could hope or think in this place this morning. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, so last two weeks ago, we looked at verse 14, and it was unbelievable that those who persecute you, that hunt you down to harm you, our response, he said, is, is to bless them. And, and in the Greek, stop cursing. Stop cursing them. Ask God's blessing of grace to be poured out upon them. And again, I didn't answer a lot of questions. It was a proverb, like a propositional statement, a divine ethic. And this morning, I want to dig in deeper and seek to be these kind of men, women, and children. The reason we come is not to fill out notebooks. We want to be metamorphosed into the image of Jesus Christ. This is, this is the image of Jesus Christ, what we're looking at. And so let's come and just say, God, do surgery. Change me. Set me free. Make me into this. This is, a, this is not, I just don't want you to have a new ethic. I want you to be a new people by the gospel and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to live this way. This is simple. Romans 1 through 11 precedes Romans 12, 14 and 12, 21. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a gospel. The only way you can ever respond this way is through this gospel. And so in the gospel, we were joined to Jesus, we saw in Romans 6, and we now have a new relationship with God. We have a new relationship with Jesus. We're a vine and a branch, and we have a new relationship with His Spirit. He dwells within us. So we have a new heart, a new desire. We're being changed now, transformed, he said, so we can know the will of God, so that we might live it by the power of God for His glory. And so this is the coloring out of how do I love how do I love? This is how I love my enemies. The overarching principle in this section, look at verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That, that's the, the principle that he's driving at in verse 14, verse 21. 
Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome it with good. I remember my poor kids had to listen to this little CD by Steve Green. It sang that song, don't be overcome by evil. And, and they had to listen to it almost every day. Guys, you overcome evil with good. These persecutors, these harmers, these evil ones as they come against us. And what Paul is calling us to is don't let their evil bring us into evil. Don't let them bring you and lead you into evil. Don't return evil for evil. You're joining them. Don't give jab for jab, slander for slander, wanting their harm, bitter, angry. Evil's overcoming you if you're sitting here bitter and angry. Don't let their evil overcome you. Don't let it take you. I beg you, it's cancer. It's cancer in your soul that will overcome you. Evil comes at you to wrong you and to hurt you. And we are not to be taken up into this evil. We don't enter into a war and escalate it and, and raise the ante to let it take us into sin with malice and hatred and revenge and wanting their ruin because they tried to bring yours. That's returning evil for evil. That's evil winning. So maybe just slow down for a second. Is evil winning in your heart this morning? I want you to just sit before God. Is evil winning? Is it, has it taken over and it's producing evil within you? And it's, it's, it's not being overcome by good that we're going to look at. God is calling us to something higher. We don't get taken into evil. It's not an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He said, do you know what kind of spirit you're of? You're of the spirit of Jesus Christ. It dwells within us. We don't call down thunder on our enemies. We overcome it. It's a, I love that word. It's a military word, nakao, where we get the word Nike. That's why we have a Nike fellowship. It means to conquer or to defeat it. So there, there's a way to conquer evil. There's a way to defeat it. And it's not to take up evil. It's not to give evil back. That just fans it into a flame, makes it greater, gets into your own heart. It's, it's just the wrong way to deal with it. There's a way to defeat it. What do we defeat it with? This instrumental with good. Your instrument to fight evil is good. And what I want to do <laughs> this morning, here's your outline, is I want to look at five ways that Paul teaches us to overcome evil with good. How do I do that? And this whole section is going to teach you how to do that. And then we'll close with verse 21. How do I get power to do this? And we're going to just look at that all next week. Of It's Jesus who overcame evil in the most beautiful way by the best good that has ever been known. That's where the power source is. And so we're just going to come and look at that all next week. Um, our whole lives are built on that, that command that no human could ever do in their own strength, what we're looking at. And I want to spend the whole Sunday, stare at it, go to the communion table and remember, and then kick off Holy Week from that holy ground. And so I am really devoted and serious to us becoming these kind of people. But I just want the gospel to break loose People would ask you every day, what's the hope within you when you become this kind of people? Because this world, nobody lives and acts like what we're looking at. So let's take a look at it. I think I, 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 uh, I cheated you. There's not five ways. There's six ways, okay? And there's only six ways in this passage. I think there's a hundred ways overall in the Bible how to overcome evil. But this morning, you're gonna, we're going to look at six ways and I've tried really hard to give you something to memorize is first, as you pray for your persecutors, the person who pays back, there's a preoccupation with appearance, there's a persistence in peace, there's a perception of the prerogative to bring revenge, and then the pursuing of their provision, we'll see in verse 20. So let's take those up. Um, we're going to move fast. Verse 14. Pray for your persecutors. And we did. We spent a whole week on that. And the freedom that comes to a heart 
when you genuinely start praying for your enemies and those who have hurt you. And it's not just, I know I'm supposed to do this. There's a freedom that finally breaks out. And I, I wrestled with it one time for years. Couldn't get free. And when it finally hit, I was able to pray so freely for this man's blessing and just desiring it and wanting it. And I remember after that, I no longer was affected by it. It just, I never forgot it, but I could reach forward to what lies ahead because it, it didn't own me. It didn't stick. It didn't make me bitter. It didn't make me hurt. And so I just want you to see is there's this place where you finally can release it when you genuinely start praying for, for God to pour out grace. And that might be grace to change them, to save them. You know, it, it's not saying what they did was okay. It was evil. Okay, this whole text is it's evil. And it, so by forgiving and praying isn't saying what they did was okay. You got to release that from why you're choking your brother or sister. It's, it's, it was wrong. It was evil. God, I'm releasing that evil. I'm absorbing the hurt and the pain and I'm releasing them. And I'm praying for their blessing and good. You'll lose 100 pounds by that beautiful advice that we get through the Holy Spirit through Paul. So let's look at the second point, the preoccupation with appearance. So verse 15 and 16, we looked at last week. I, I did go back over my notes and I missed 50% of what I had, but I'm not going to re-preach it. So I, I really think though, let love not have hypocrisy has been verse nine, the theme of this section. You want to lose hypocritical love, here it is, is rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. When we finally have koinonia in our relationship in Jesus Christ, we, we really care about your rejoicing and your weeping. And it's not doing the right thing, it's loving. And therefore we care. And we're, we're of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Don't pay back evil for evil to anyone, verse 14. And here's our new point. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Respect. This is the preoccupation with appearance. The Greek word for respect is the idea of thinking before. Think, there's, there's this preposition pro. It means before. So think before it actually comes upon you or at you. Consider in advance. Foresight, planning, anticipate. A planning that, that when these things come at me, I'm going to respond uh, with, with good. I'm going to bring goodness into these situations. King James translated it, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. So we are to be preoccupied with what our, our practice manifests to the world. And so this is tricky because there's such a thing as eye-pleasing that is condemned, and that's not what this is. This is thinking about God. It's thinking about what do I reflect to the world about God by how I respond to those who attack me. It's the, the beautiful Matthew 5. Let your light shine before men. Go live this way in such a way that they may see your good works, loving your enemies, forgiving them, praying for them, blessing them. That's good work here. And that will glorify your father who's in heaven. I just want to reflect to this world, God. I want to show them Jesus Christ. And you're not going to show them any more clear than when you treat enemies like this. It just shines. Jesus Christ. Glory to God. So what's getting at uh, this passage? There's a world that is just looking to chew you up when you return evil for evil. I, I can't remember the details, but I was at a football game once. And, and there was a guy playing, and it was a pro game, and, and he claimed to be a Christian. And he got mad and got in a shoving match, and everyone around me, some Christian he is, and they're, I mean, they were just throwing their Cokes and popcorn, and they were so ready to chew that man up. Look at that good Christian man punching him back. And they're just, they, they do it, they revenge, they retaliate, they punch, but if you do it, they're going to devour you. Just like, see, phonies. You're hypocrites. They just wait for that. And, the, and what this is getting at then is if someone does evil to you, don't think only about yourself. It's big. It isn't just me. Give thought to the effect of, of it, what you do will have upon mankind. And what will others think of my God 
by how I respond to this. The world is watching and they smell out hypocrites. And Paul is saying, it's, it's not my honor, it's the honor of God at stake. We're not to commend, we are to commend God to men by our daily living. To give evil for evil is betraying your calling. It cannot be our honor. It's the honor of the risen one. It's not that my honor has been hurt. It's, I don't want to hurt his honor. So let us give no offense. The gospel is on display by us. Paul said, you're our letter. You're our letter. John Blanchard, when I met him, he, he said, there's five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and your own life. And most will never read the first four. I'm going to go be the gospel to this world. And in this, how I respond to evil and persecutors, I'm going to give forth the view of Jesus Christ. So this is not man-pleasing, but man-saving. Colossians 4, 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of your opportunity, which is this life. So the question is, are you living with this preoccupation? Or is it, hey, if I want to blow up, I'll, I'll blow up. I, I just, I struggle with anger, so I, I'll just blow up. If you push me too far, I got to write. What a great argument to give evil for evil defames the name of God. I've read something this week I wanted to share with you. On January 19th, 1999 in India, there was an Australian missionary. <coughs> He'd been there, I think, 34 years. And he was driving with his two sons, and, and his sons were 10 and 6. And when they stopped, some radical Hindu worshipers came and surrounded them. And they set the car on fire. And the three of them were burned to death. His name was Graham. I, it was 34 years that he was ministering there. And two days later, his wife Gladys spoke to the region in a newspaper. They had done so much ministry there that the newspaper actually interviewed them. And she said this, I have one message for the people of India. I'm not bitter. Neither am I angry. I have one great desire, that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who gave his life for their sins. And she said, me and my lone daughter will be staying. She said, India is our home, and this is where we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, and we will continue to serve until the end. And then her daughter said, I thank God that he considered my dad worthy enough to suffer for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's Romans 12. And the spirit blew through that region by that testimony. Pray for those who persecute you. Preoccupation with appearance. I want to show the gospel by the way I endure persecution. Look with me now in verse 18. I'm going to call this persistence. In peace, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Here's our calling. Be at peace with all men. The Christian is not to be the one who's always in conflict, the initiator. We're going to see as we journey this, there will come conflict by your testimony. But what I want you to see is what I have seen in my journey is if your whole life is conflict, put a saddle on. <laughs> okay. Quit saying, it's because it's I'm faithful. And everyone else would say, it's because you're unfaithful. And I just want you to pray over this principle. This is big. You're just always stirring it up and causing fights and dissensions. I love a good fight. I fight the fight of faith. I want you just to hear the scriptures. Paul's going to say in two chapters that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let us pursue the things, he said, which make for peace and the building up of one another. There's that persecuted word. Let us hunt down how to bring the things that bring peace in the body of Christ and even without. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue, persecute peace with all men. Go after it, hunt it down. Psalm 34, 14, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Pursue after peace. James 3, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds of gentleness of wisdom. 
But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, which was last week in Romans, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. It's earthly, it's natural, it's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle and reasonable and full of mercy and good fruits. I love this. It's unwavering. So you got peace and unwavering and this whole section without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This isn't a side issue. This is a major gospel issue. When it comes to conflict, we're like the fire line. The fire can't go any further when it comes to me. Friction and faction stop at us. We don't stir it up and douse it. I think this needs to be answered. Do I pursue peace? Is there a wounded relationship that I have not come in humility and love and tried to heal and reconcile? And I'll tell you this, that I know there's some relationships you can't heal because there's danger, there's prison. So I just want you to know that this isn't just no exceptions. There's some relationships that you should not, you, you forgive in your heart, but you can't go make peace. And I just, I acknowledge that. But this is for the other 99% of what happens. And this is just conflicts, broken relationships, never healing them, being self-righteous. This is a call. This is a call to examine ourselves before God. Am I a peacemaker and am I bringing peace or am I the the one lighting fires everywhere I turn and everywhere I go? And I want you to catch the one word if possible. And so do all we can. And there's just some who can't be reconciled. The scriptures tell us that. So I'm a, I'm a peacemaker and I hunt it down and I pursue it. But I think of David and Saul where David tried to make peace with Saul throughout that whole relationship. And he just, he he could, you couldn't calm it. You couldn't, no matter what David did, it would not go down. And then when Saul dies, David says, is there anyone left from Saul and Jonathan's line that I can show favor to? And he pours out grace and Mephibosheth comes to his table to sit at the table of grace. But I just want you to hear this. There's times it's not possible to let yourself up. There's times where I, I've hunted it down and I've worked with family members or, or workmates and they, they just are irreconcilable. It isn't going to happen. Jesus said... I didn't come to bring peace in families. I came to bring a sword. <laughs> There's going to be a division in humanity with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll be a divider of men. Houses will be set against each other. So I just want you to hear that. If you follow Jesus Christ, it will bring controversy. So this isn't a call to be mushy and never speak truth. Okay, this is a call that I'm, I'm a peace, I'm a peacemaker, blessed are they, and I'm pursuing it, I'm hunting it down, and there's some times where it's the gospel that's going to bring division and enmity and hatred towards you to where they even want to kill you. That's all how this is going to work together. But how much of your controversy is because of how you've handled yourself? That's what we're dealing with in our own hearts. The separation should be because you were like Jesus Christ, not because... You are like flesh. We're for peace. And we're called to peace and not compromise. We're to lay down pride, not the gospel. And so just hear those words, so far as it depends on you. And so I'm going to do everything I can to make peace with conflicts and my enemies and those who want to hurt me. I'm, I'm going I'm to go hard. I'm going to pursue it. Have you... Have you done everything possible to be at peace with all men? That's what to care, is to characterize the ones who had a God pursue them for peace. He went to the ends of the earth of hunting you down to bring you into this sweet forgiveness and reconciling you to himself. And so I, I will go to great lengths to pursue peace.
because of the way God has done that for me. I, I live in the gospel. And those who have this peace with God, go and seek peace. Pray for your persecutors, how to overcome evil. Have a preoccupation for appearance, that, that they, they respect what is right in the sight of all men. We give thought to it. And we are persistent in peace. I just think we write it off too quickly in America. We're just quick to say, I tried. They're just they're dogs and hogs. And we, we just write them off and we're, we're not hunting it down. It isn't this drive and passion that is going to put Christ on display. And now in verse 19, I want to call it the perception of the prerogative. Verse 19 then, never take your own revenge, beloved. <coughs> Leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So now we look at this hurt that's come. Here's the command. Don't take your own revenge. I will take this into my own hands is what we say. I got this. Court systems are trash. These people are smug. They're going to get away with it. I know how to handle people like this. I'm going to put a curse on them. I'm going to do it like I get a voodoo doll and stick nails in them and just, I'll get them. I'm going to give them what they deserve. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It just sounds so righteous, doesn't it? <laughs> it's not. How do I get there? I just love this word I spent. I could spend all week on this word easy. Beloved. I love that. Never take your own revenge. Beloved. Those who are loved by God because Jesus Christ was punished in your place. He has set his saving grace upon you freely. And you know what I think Paul's doing here? You'll let God be God in giving you grace. Don't you love that? I, I love grace. I love being beloved. It's just the best title I've ever had. Beloved. And I just receive it and I drink it up like grace. It's beautiful. But how about now, let, let God be God and give out justice. Let, let God give out judgment and vengeance. You, you're, you're ready to let him be God in your salvation and bringing love. Get out of his seat. You're not fit for the job. I promise you. There was only one who is fit for the seat to bring justice and judgment. You can't do it. And so he's saying, get out of it. Quit doing it. When others attack you and harm you, remind yourself you're loved by God and they can't take that away. They can, they can come to try to destroy you, blow you up, harm you. You're loved by God and they can't separate you from it. I, just, I love that. This is the power to respond this way. I'm loved by God. And it, just, it, it is the power to now respond this way. It's the therefore but we want to take justice into our own hands. And Paul's saying, let him be God in the exercising of this. I guess I would say this, it's not your prerogative to give justice. It's not your calling. God will right all the wrongs. He quotes De Deuteronomy 32, 35. Vengeance is mine and retribution, says God. In due time, their foot will slip. For the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. Vengeance is mine, says God. I will repay, says the Lord. That's an incredible Greek word. It's from a business ledger. And it's saying that God will balance all the books to the ethical penny of everything that was done wrong. God will balance it. In 2 Thessalonians, he says he's going to come back. And he says, after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who have afflicted you. He, he can handle this job. It's God's prerogative to right wrongs. Don't usurp him. Don't usurp. Taking vengeance into your own hands, I want you to hear this. It's blasphemy to God. I'm called to good, not to do God's work. You act like an atheist. When you do this, you are not the Charles Bronson of Christianity. And for those who laugh, they're over 60. <laughs> How about you're not the Liam Neeson 
I, I'm, old, I'm old too. Jack Bauer, Jason Bourne, you tell me, young guys. You're just not that. You're not the one going around retaliating, getting revenge, bringing it. This should not, this, is, this hit me so hard. This should not be confining to us to take your hands off of avenging wrong. I don't want you to sit here going, no, this is horrible. Why would God make me do this? I want you to hear this morning, this is the most liberating thing you could ever do. Let go. God's will is for our good, right? This is his will. It's for our blessing and it's for your freedom. He's not trying to make you miserable. This isn't to make you just sit here and be miserable. It's it's the blessing that would come if you'd look at the gospel of Jesus Christ and release this heart of vengeance. Who can do it better than God? Do you know that he has perfect justice? He's the only one who will never get it wrong. He knows perfectly what needs to be done. I'm so selfish, I have no ability to be partial. And it says that he's the God who impartially judges. I'm like the sons of thunder, man. Bring lightning. God has perfect justice. And we can trust him. And I want you to hear this real clearly. I will always deal out too much or too little. He's the only one who's going to get it perfect. And you, you can be released to let him be God. And let him do that. And I'm not insensitive. I I know some of the hurts. I've sat at tables for hours of what you're carrying. And I I just cry over what some of you have endured. But I just know to nurse it and hold it and love it is never going to help you. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can release it and be free. But if I don't give them justice... If I don't make them pay, what do I do? Well, I'm glad you asked. I feel so helpless in not avenging this wrong then. And so listen, we don't give them what they deserve. We give them what we didn't deserve. Grace. I did not deserve this gospel. I can't get over it. And I'm going to give them what I did not deserve. Do they deserve it? They don't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. I want to give them grace. The kindness of God. The mercies of God in Christ Jesus. As you look at them, you can lay it down. You lay it down so God can take it up. That's freedom. That is freedom. The spirit of revenge, this whole section is what? Let your love not have hypocrisy. And the spirit of revenge blocks love. It, it, it dams it up. And so I just tell you, you, you live in this. And what I can tell you right now is you're not overflowing in agape love to those around you. It just stops it. And so this whole thing is how to love God and love others. This desire for revenge and bitterness will block you and your love. Let it go. Lay it down so you can love again. You're so taken up with revenge that's changing you. Ask your people around you. Am I changing? Is this making me different? Yeah, you look 30 years older. It's killing you. You're dying. You look like a lemon-sucking Christian. Because it's killing you. It killed your love. And it's feeding your self-love. Because all you can do is sit around and think about how bad you've been treated and what happened. And and so you just meditate on that 24-7. You replay every tape. And it's just feeding self-love. And you're lost in it. And I want you to hear this. I say it in love. You're a victim and not a victor. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is to make us victorious in him. And not to live all of your days a victim. The victim's mentality is death. How can you be a victim when God gave you Jesus Christ? You are a victor to love God and love others. I've prayed for your freedom this morning to see chains of bitterness and revenge and unforgiveness fall off. I hope there's 10,000 chains in here when we finish this service. I hope you trip walking out on all the chains. Is that chain still here? 
No, he, he took it. Pray it falls off that your dungeon would flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. All right, I got to hurry. The fifth one. You're going to wish there was only five points. There's still another one. In verse 20, you, you pursue their provision then. Okay? Verse 20, but if your enemy's hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. So this is not a, a, a call to be hands off by no vengeance, but hands on. And these hands on, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. God is going to deal with the wrongs so you can deal with the goods. You can show mercy because God will take care of the vengeance. And in so doing, you'll heap burning coals upon their head. And the question is, what, what does that mean? Now you're talking, Pastor. I like this idea, hot coals on their head. Bring it, bring it. You're not going to like the answer. <laughs> it could be what you're thinking to bring down the cursings of God. Your good acts will increase their final judgment in the end. Stir it up. I want more wrath. Just hot coals, pour out kindness, and they'll get it twice as bad when God acts on them. Don't lash out. Be kind. God will get them. Doesn't that run counter to the whole context? Like, I don't think there's one soul in here who reads those verses and thinks that's right. Unless you're bitter. So it's just clear, that's not it. Proverbs 24, 17, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. But I think the second possibility is a metaphorical statement. And, it, and it's going to cause your enemy great pain. But it's the pain of shame and remorse and hopefully repentance. They gave evil and all that came out of you was kindness and love. There's something that stings more than vengeance, and it's kindness. Railing on someone has never changed a human being in my journey. Fighting back has never got it done. It just stirs it up. But I have watched kindness melt the hearts of many enemies. And some of your testimonies are salvation that came from this kind of example. 1 Peter 3, 1, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word of God, so they're disobeying God's word, they might be won without a word by the excellent behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. There, there's the principle. And so my friends, this is God's way. When we pour out kindness, this is our, our prayer God, let your kindness lead them to repentance. I'm, I'm pouring hot coals on their head that they might have shame and repent and turn to God. Isn't that God's way? In Romans 2, 4. So laying into them will never produce repentance. And, and I, I just one last thing, you won't feel better. If you've ever lashed out at someone and got revenge, did you ever walk home saying that that was worth it? It was just like this instant, oh, If I could put your ear to just to the abyss of hell, just for 10 seconds, you would pray right now for your enemy. I promise you, you, you would, your worst enemy right now, you'd be like, oh God, no. You can't want that for anybody. You deserved it. And Christ entered into punishment and bore it at such a great cost so that now you can return good for evil. You've been set free by Jesus Christ. You can return evil with good. Do you want to reconcile men or alienate them? May they find in us that which commends Christ to their hearts. We can't go halfway in this. Most of our lives are, I didn't return evil. Aren't you proud of me, honey? I've come so far in my Christian life. I, I just bit my tongue. But we, there's no coals on their head. I got to not re retaliate, but I've got to go now and pursue them with kindness, love, mercy, 
And I'll tell you this, it is easier to preach than to live. This is so hard. That's what it means to know Christ. Peter said he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. He trusted what he's asking us to do, that God can judge righteously. Jesus had to do it. And he uttered no threats. And in verse 21 then, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our weapon of warfare is goodness and kindness, and it leads men to repentance. And I'll close with this this true story that I shared 25 years ago that still hits me to this day. There was this man who was loose and careless lifestyle, very debauched, very sinful, and his wife got saved, and she bore the wrath and ridicule of her husband for a long time. And she prayed for him, and she said, the prayers seemed to only harden him. The more I prayed, he just got worse. And one night, her husband went out with his friends, boozing it up again. And he's there with all his friends, and he starts boasting. I have the most submissive wife on the face of the earth. She'll do anything that I want. And he said, I'll prove my point. My wife's been in bed for three hours. Let's go home, wake her up, and she will just wake up and prepare us a meal, and she's going to do it with a smile. And they're, they're like, no way. That woman doesn't exist. And they go, and they wake her up, and she arises, and she begins to serve the drunken men one of the best meals that they ever had. And she did it with cheerfulness. And one of the drunkards was so touched by this woman. She said, I know you're very religious, and you don't approve of what we do, how are you able to serve us in this way? And this is her answer. I and my husband were both formerly unconverted, but by the grace of God alone, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have daily prayed for my husband and done all that I can to bring my husband to a better mind, but I see no change. And I fear that he will be lost forever. And I have made up my mind to do all that I can to make him happy while he's here. And after the men left, her husband said, do you really think I'll be unhappy forever in hell? She said, I fear so. And he said, I would to God, she said, I would to God that you would repent and seek his forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And that night the man was converted. That's hot coals. How do we defeat evil? Not with evil, not with protest for protest. We engage it with good. And I want to hear of a hundred baptisms of people who were saved by us returning evil with good. Don't spend your days getting lost in other people's sins, weaknesses, hurts, offenses, and shortcomings. Get lost in the one who overcame evil with good. And that's who we'll stare at next week and go to the table and remember the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest evil that was ever done was overcome with the greatest good that has ever been known to humanity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. I do pray for release for every soul in this room. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be those who sit in the seat of God. Lord, we trust you and we know that you're able to handle these situations. And so instead of retaliating, Lord, help us to take up the armor of good, the armor of kindness, God, toward our enemies, to where we pray for your blessing upon them and we actually engage with blessings in our hands and in our lives. God, no human could ever do this unless they are taken up with the one who did this on our behalf on a cross. God, let us gaze at him this morning. Let us find forgiveness, full forgiveness for what retaliators we truly are, God, thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes away all sin. And that blood makes us desire all the more to walk in his steps, to love the way that he loved. God, make us these kind of lovers at Southside Bible Church. Grow us in it, deepen us in it, so that the name of Jesus Christ would be called upon and loved and adored by all who come in contact with us. God, thank you for the beauty of this message and truth.
truth in Romans 12. God, work in every heart now. I pray. I pray for those that are hurting right now under the word of God, that you would heal it up with Jesus Christ, that they would call out and cry to him for the healing and the comfort and the release of these weights and burdens that they've carried their whole life. And it's sometimes scary to think of life without that. And I pray, Lord, let it fall down at Calvary, even this morning, bring healing to our hearts. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.